Hello and welcome to our employment law update webinar, or at least it was intended to be a webinar. Um, for those of you who are booked on, and we had a, a, a very large number of bookings, which I was absolutely delighted about, um, but then absolutely gutted that then there seemed to be a bit of a problem in, in uh, with everyone trying to access the update. So I'm still not quite sure what happened there. All I do know is that the problem was at our end and not at your end. Um, so please don't question any of your own IT skills. It was definitely ours, or should I say mine. Um, but in any case, what that does mean is that we can record the webinar now. You can now watch it at your leisure. You can go and get yourself a cup of tea and a croissant at any point that you uh, choose to. And in fact, perhaps even fast forward over the um, bits that aren't quite so important to you. So um, hopefully, in fact, perhaps this works out a little bit better for everyone. Um, but anyway, we are going to uh, have a session over about the next hour and a half. I will split these videos up into, into appropriate sections, bite-sized chunks, you could say, um, so that then you can, um, again, just sort of uh, go in and out of the bits of the uh, webinar that you would prefer to. Um, but hopefully you're going to find all of it useful. Of course, that's the intention. Um, and there is quite a lot for us to to cover during the course of the session. Um, and in particular, I'm a little bit relieved that I'm not doing it live because if I was doing it live, then of course I would have the hard stop at uh, 11.30 after an hour and a half. And, um, and I was a little bit worried that perhaps I'd written too much content and that I would struggle to get everything in on time. Now, because uh, everyone's just going to be watching it on demand, so to speak, then um, the pressure is less. So perhaps this is like those bonus uh, bo bonus podcasts or, or bonus features on films that you get so that you can you can actually watch a little bit more if you want to. So um, now of course this slide is referring to questions and uh, because we are now not live unfortunately the downside of it is that you can't ask your questions during the course of the session. Um, now that is particularly unfortunate given that I'd also set up a, a system to try to uh, ensure you, this is using the uh, software of Slido to, to try to make it a little bit more interactive because I'm very conscious that these sessions aren't necessarily the most interactive a session. They lose something as opposed to being in person. But uh, in any event, um, I don't want you to miss out on being able to ask you questions. So if you do have some, then please do email me, call me, or alternatively direct message me on either LinkedIn or, or Twitter and, uh, and then I can answer some of the questions that you might have uh, in that format instead. Okay, so that takes us through to what our agenda is. And as, as promised, it's quite a packed agenda. Of course, we have got uh, issues of furlough because furlough is still a very important topic and it is changing um, quite considerably. So I'm sure you're probably all aware that it changed as of the 1st of July. So we're gonna be going into all of the, the changes that are as a result of that. Um, the Treasury have also issued a new direction um, and there's a particular piece in that direction which has caused quite a few issues and concerns shall we say so we're going to address address that during the course of the time as well. We are going to have a look at uh, data protection and data protection and people working from home um, and then of course getting into our uh, case law update and then at the end of the session also having a look at some uh, of the sort of larger wider issues that are going to be coming to the fore over the coming months so not necessarily legislative changes but just issues that employers are going to have to be going to have to be dealing with over the over the coming months so a bit of a packed agenda but uh, anyway let's crack on with the flexible furlough scheme so as of course you're aware, it all came into force, or should I say it all changed on the 1st of July, um, just over a week ago now. Um, and the changes that are made are really very significant indeed. And you now need to keep on your toes a little bit because of course the scheme is going to be changing on a month to month basis. I mean, whilst of course we've had to keep on our toes until now anyway, because the guidance has been changing quite regularly, the scheme itself hasn't been changing, whereas now, we are entering into the um, a period of time where the scheme is going to change on the first of every month until the uh, scheme ceases on the 
uh, on the 31st of October. So in terms of the actual changes that we're seeing, I'm sure you've seen them all trailed and you're probably fully aware of these, but uh, just to very briefly summarize, um, from the 1st of July, people can now be part-time furloughed and work part-time. So whereas before what we were having to do was it was either, you know, it was a very straightforward on-off system. So you were either on furlough or you were working your normal hours. Whereas what we're going to be able to do now, and it's part of the intention of the of the scheme to provide a, a, a gradual um, ramping up of the economy, is to allow people to begin to work part time. During this period of time, you can still claim up to the maximum of the 80% of someone's salary, um, obviously subject to the cap as we had before of two and a half thousand pounds. But of course that gets prorated back so if, say, for example, someone is only working half of their normal hours, then the most that you're going to be able to claim is 40% or 1250 uh, gross per month. So that's how the, how the scheme is going to work. Um, then on the 1st of August, we then have a further change in that then the contributions that employers have to start making um, kick in. So as of the 1st of August, then employers are going to be required to play, pay the employer's national insurance contributions and also the employer's uh, pension contributions. Whereas at the moment, that's all covered by the, by the furlough scheme. The 1st of September, we then get this further change where the employers are having to contribute 10%. And that's the essentially the of the 80%, the employer provides 10% and the CJRS scheme, the Corona Job Retention Scheme, provides 70%. Um, to put that into actual figures, um, that means it's capped at £312.50 is the employer's uh, contribution that it would have to make on the basis that it's hitting the cap of £2,500. And then on the 1st of October, it then ramps up again. So we're then looking at a uh, a 20% contribution, so again works in the same way, so 20% by the employer, 60% by the CGRS scheme, and that's capped at £625 for the employer's contribution. So it's £625 from the employer, £1,875 uh, from the government. Okay, obviously all of that is subject to um, whatever pro-rating may be taking place in the scheme because of the part-time working uh, that, that might be undertaken. Okay, so that's the main changes to the scheme. So what are we, what are we also looking at? So what are the limitations? So obviously the way that it works is that the employer has to pay um, for the hours worked by the employee and then the hours that aren't worked by the employee then gets picked up by the by the job retention scheme. There's no minimum or maximum time here. So it's not as if you have to do it in weekly chunks or even daily chunks. You could do it in half day chunks. You could do it on, you know, somebody comes in for an hour on a particular day. It is entirely up to you, albeit that of course, you're gonna have to do the record keeping on this. So the the more flexible your um your arrangements are in relation to the part-time working that's being undertaken then the greater onus is going to be on you in terms of record keeping and also calculating your claim as well um so it's really up to you as to uh, as to what extent you you flex it in that way um we have the 10th of june cutoff date so again you've probably all come across this date um, but effectively what this is this means is that anybody that didn't start any employee that didn't start a period of furlough by the 10th of june and of course that period of furlough that then started on the 10th of june would have to last for at least three weeks but anybody that didn't start a period of furlough before that time uh, isn't able to access the scheme so it's an absolute cutoff in relation to that with a couple of exceptions um, uh, and this has really come, come as a result of some serious campaigning by the Maternity Alliance. Um, so all credit to them in relation to this, because of course anybody that was on maternity leave wouldn't be able to return 
to work before the 10th of June if they remained on maternity leave. And, and accordingly, if they then returned to work, say, for example, in the middle of July, then they couldn't be furloughed. So what the government has done is it's recognised this issue and has said that anybody who is returning to work after a, uh, a long period of family leave, whether that be maternity leave, shared parental leave, um, adoption leave um, or parental leave, then the 10th of June date um, doesn't apply. So then they can be put on furlough. And also, as a result of a recent announcement last week, we've also got military reservists who are now included and now added onto that list as well. Okay. Um, and in terms of the sort of work that you provide, it doesn't necessarily have to be their normal job. You could provide them with other work, albeit that obviously that would be subject to the agreement um, between you and the employee of that being able to, uh, to take place. And of course, also when, if you are wanting to, um, if you are wanting to furlough someone on a part-time basis, you're going to have to agree that with them. So it's, it's not necessarily something that you can, uh, force on people, albeit that I'll, I'll, I'll get onto that in a moment because you do have some options. Um, uh, you have some options in terms of where, whether you require people to continue to be furloughed in the essentially the full-time basis that it is at the moment or return part-time or so on and so forth which I then cover in this slide here so here are your options now so whereas before you didn't really have any options it was either furlough or work now the options come 1st of July is that you continue to furlough them, but you put them on the flexible furlough scheme. So you get them undertaking part-time work or part-time furlough as I've referred to there. Um, or you continue as before. So you just continue to have them furloughed on a full-time basis uh, and getting paid the 80% or maximum £2,500 as provided for at the moment. Or if they've come back to work you might want to re-furlough them, of course, ensuring that they have uh, met the requirements in terms of the 10th of June cutoff. Or you might want to change your rotation or have a rotation. Uh, all of these are options that are available to you. I'm going to get on to the, the issues in relation to rotation uh, in a second. Now, just so that you can see this completely. So let's have a look at some of the detail of the actual claim rules. So just a word of warning that in terms of the claims that you have to make to the scheme up to the period ending the 30th of June, you've got to ensure that those are made to the scheme by the 31st of July. Any claim that you're going to make that covers the period after the 1st of July, you've got to make by the 30th of November, but each month you now have to separate. So whereas before, you could batch things up. And I certainly know a few employers that have batched things up in a way that uh, they, they made a claim for March, April and May all together in one. You can't do that anymore. And of course, the main reason why you can't do that anymore is because the change, the, the, the calculations in, in relation to each month are going to be changing on a monthly basis. If you have more than 100 employees, you can do that as a batch as before. But if you are have got less than 100 employees, then you need to do that on an individual basis. So you need to, or at least you need to provide the individual uh, in, uh, information for each individual employee. If you're submitting the information in a batch, there are lots of templates on the government website that are very useful. Um, and of course, in terms of the additional information that you're having to provide for uh, employees that you didn't have to provide before is that you're having to provide information in relation to the actual hours that they have worked and also what their usual hours would have been because of the part-time nature. Make sure also that you retain your records for up to six years and this is going to include the record of hours worked and their usual hours. So again as I indicated before this is going to be so much easier if you just set a, a, a pattern which is then um, which which then continues throughout the period or at least uh, one that isn't entirely flexible perhaps is one that uh, in the same way that a rehabilitation plan for someone returning from long-term sick 
that it would gradually increase, uh, something like that, um, rather than uh, daily or weekly changes to hours worked. And we're also hearing that uh, the, the, the timing of the payments, or at least, the, should I say, the speed that payments are being made uh, by the HMRC are really quite quick and that it's, net, it's being made within six to 10 days. And we've also got a technical issue or a technical point, I should say, in relation to how you calculate um, uh, your claim. It, the HMRC has clarified that that should be based on calendar days and not working days. Um, that might be something that you pick up with your accountants because I think lots of accountants were previously working on the basis of working days. So let's have a look at rotation then. So if you are rotating staff around, now of course before what you had to do is you had to be rotating on a three weekly basis um, because that was the minimum period of claim that you could make. Now that doesn't exist. So you can rotate in really in whichever way that you want. So if you want to rotate on a, on a weekly basis, on a three day basis or whatever, it's entirely flexible. There are no rules now in terms of the flexibility that you've got in terms of when people are working and when they're not working and when they're on furlough. But there are a couple of points that we need to be aware of. Um, of course, we know the issue in relation to uh, 10th of June, but there is also another point in, in relation to the total of number of employees that you can have on furlough at any one time. Um, that doesn't appear to have got a, a huge amount of attention. Now, let me just explain this because it's probably easier if I just use some numbers and give you a couple of scenarios and then we can uh, uh, explain it there. Because let's assume that you have 100 employees and in March and April and May and June, you, the capacity of your business was such that actually you only needed half of your employees in. So what you did was you furloughed half of them. So you furloughed 50 employees and you have the other 50 employees working as normal. Now, from the 1st of July, obviously you cannot furlough all 100 of your employees and put them on a 50% uh, work and 50% furlough, which would seem like a, a very fair thing to do um, to sort of spread the pain, so to speak. Um, but you can't do that because, of course, not a, only 50 of your employees would have been furloughed before the 10th of June. So that's fairly obvious. Now, if, however, before, before the uh, 1st of July, that rather than just doing 50 were working and uh, 50 are on furlough, that actually what you were doing in order to try to make it fair was rotating those employees around. So you'd have 50 working for a period of three weeks and 50 on furlough for three weeks and then vice versa throughout that period of time. So you have actually had all 100 employees furloughed at some point before the 10th of June. So all looks good so far, but, and this is where one of the rules then begins to provide a bit of a problem for us. And that is that one of the other rules, which of course is gonna be an anti-fraud measure, um, but what one of the rules says is that you cannot have more em any more employees furloughed post 1st of July than the maximum number of employees that you had furloughed at any one time before the, the 1st of July. So, of course, in the scenario I've just given where we've got 100 employees, but 50 of are rotating, uh, but they're all rotating around, the maximum number of employees that we've got on furlough at any one time is 50. And so therefore the maximum number of employees that we can have on furlough post 1st of July is 50. So despite the fact that all 100 had been furloughed at some point before the 10th of June, we cannot then part-time furlough everyone on a 50% basis after the 1st of July. So rather unfortunate, but unfortunately that's just one of the restrictions that, that have been placed on the scheme. So, obtaining agreement. Now, of course, you have to obtain written agreement. Now, I'm sure we've all been using our, um, our template agreements and our, uh, our written agreements and getting agreement in from our employees. Um, whilst 
the rules appear, or I say appear, whilst the rules were relaxed a little in terms of whether you actually need a signed document or not, um, all the HMRC wanted to see was evidence of an agreement in place. And of course, the best way of doing that is by having that in writing. Now, the, the recently published rules are a bit clearer in terms of actually having a written agreement in place. So we strongly recommend that you do have a written agreement rather than anything uh, looser than that. So if you don't have one in at the moment, then please do put one in place and we can help you out with any of the relevant documentation in that regard. Now, if you have got employees who you have had on furlough under the, uh, I'll, I'll, for want of a better way of putting it, under a normal furlough agreement, um, if you are moving them on to part-time furlough, you will need a new agreement. Uh, because of the nature of the change of the scheme. Um, so you can't rely upon the old agreement or your previous agreements that you've used. Um, of course, if you are continuing to just simply furlough people on the same basis that they were before, so furloughing people on a full-time basis and not taking advantage of the part-time opportunities of the scheme, then you can continue to use that the agreement that you've already got in place. There's no need to change it. But if you are wanting to use the and take advantage of the part-time nature and the flexibility of the new scheme, then you need a new agreement in place. We have a template agreement, so please do get in touch with us if you do want to copy. The only thing that we would ask in return, we're not going to uh, levy a charge or anything on you for it, but if you're not an existing client of ours, then the one thing that we would ask is that you give us permission to uh, add you onto our email update. Uh, lists so that we can keep in contact with you in the future. Of course, you can unsubscribe to them at any time, but hopefully you will find them useful in any event. Now, in terms of reaching agreement, then of course, you know, it's, it's like any other normal contractual issue in that you need to get the agreement of the individual. So you can't necessarily force this on them. So if they are not in agreement with the um, with the requirements that you're placing on them. So if they don't want to return part-time, then from a contractual basis, they don't have to agree to it. So it's like any contractual change. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we, uh, we don't have options if they do refuse, uh, and I'm going to move on to those, I assure you. Of course, if you've got collective bargaining in place, then you can simply make an agreement with the trade union and that is then going to be binding on all of the employees who's who are in that bargaining unit and have that collective agreement incorporated into their contract of employment so that makes it actually quite quite simple so you don't have to do it on an individual basis um, and of course one of the other things that you need to have a think about when you're putting this agreement together is whether in fact you're you're going to establish what the hours are going to be or whether you're going to give yourself the ultimate flexibility with the pros and cons in terms of the record keeping and the complexity of the claims uh, that you're then going to have to make that may then follow from that. Now we wouldn't expect you necessarily to have too much difficulty in getting agreement from employees because hopefully most of them are now fed up of being at home um, and want to be able to do some work. That might not be the case. I might be being far too uh, far, far too positive on that front or perhaps far too naive. But also the other positive, of course, for uh, the individual employee is that then they're going to be able to increase their income because they're not going to be limited by the uh, by the 80% or, or the cap. They're going to be earning their normal wage again for those hours that they're working. So it gives them the opportunity to to, to increase their earnings, which given that they may have been on reduced income for quite quite some months now, might be something that's really quite welcome to them. So I appreciate that actually, if you've been one of the generous employers who've been topping up during this time, that that does make things uh, somewhat more difficult to achieve that agreement, because then there's not necessarily a huge incentive for employees to return, unless of course you decide to remove that top up on, in the event that uh, somebody refuses to come back. And that's something that, of course, you might be able to look at in terms of the agreement that you've already got in place. So what do you do if somebody is going to refuse? Well, 
if somebody does refuse to work part-time, you may need to consider dismissal. And it is something that you have got as an option here in, in your toolkit here, if, if need be. Um, because if you have work for them to do, but not enough for them to return on a full-time basis, you might be entitled to dismiss them um, if they don't agree to a temporary change in their terms. Um, obviously, that's going to be a, some other substantial reason dismissal, and it is going to vary on a case-by-case -case basis. And there are particular issues where, in fact, you probably um, either won't want to be dismissing, or at least we need to be very aware of the risks if you were to proceed with a dismissal. Because if it is that somebody can't return to work because of, say, for example, childcare issues, or because they are, are shielding or live with somebody who is shielding, um, then we're going to have to take that into account. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact on the decision about whether it's fair and potentially also discriminatory, of course, for us to be dismissing in those circumstances. I'm going to be turning on to the whole issue of childcare uh, and, uh, and part-time furlough and people returning to work in those situations very shortly. So don't worry, I'm going to cover that in a little bit more more detail but it's certainly some of the things that we need to have a, a think about isn't it um, so moving on selecting employees for furlough so for example if you are in a situation where again taking our em employer with 100 employees nice round number I know um, and it's had 50 of those employees furloughed full-time but doesn't necessarily need or want to bring back all of those 50 employees yet it only wants to say bring 20 employees back on a part-time basis so it's about selecting those people particularly given that there is now going to be a financial boost to those employees um, who are going to be selected to return to work on a part-time basis so how do we do that because we need to make sure that we're not going to be discriminating against people we need to make sure that the process in which we do that is going to be fair and reasonable so it's not going to undermine the trust and confidence in the relationship because if we do that then of course it then potentially raises issues of discrimination claims constructive uh, unfair dismissal claims and so what we need to be focusing in on are the skills and roles now often when we're bringing in uh, bringing back employees on on the basis that uh, you know there are some parts of the business where we need employees back and there are other parts where we don't need them back that's going to be very much focusing in on the skills and roles um, rather than uh, rather than actually a any other issue but if it's but if it's wider than that if it's simply that you know we require say five pe five employees to come back within a an existing group of 10 and of course bear in mind that we've got this limitation in the actual number that we can we can bring back given the restrictions uh, of the total number of people that we've furloughed previously, we might simply have to get into a selection mode. And certainly what ACAS are recommending is that essentially we get out our redundancy selection criteria and use that in a way to select those who are going to be uh, selected to come back to work. And obviously what that means is the higher scorers are those that you then select to bring back okay but essentially using that that model okay and then so let's let's have a look at some of the frequently asked questions that we're that, that we we've been getting in in this area so can we have employees return to full-time working not be furloughed um, but do so on the same pay level that furlough would have provided so essentially if we have got somebody who has been uh, earning, say, £800 uh, a, a month. Sorry, I'm not using the best figures now, am I? But they're earning £800 a month on furlough. But obviously, normally, they would be earning £1,000 per month. If you were to require them to come back and work full time, can you continue to pay them £800 per month? Well, yes, you can. But obviously that's subject to agreeing it with them you can make a temporary change to the wages obviously ensuring that that um, you are still complying with the minimum requirements in relation to the national minimum wage uh, which for those who are obviously at the lower 
uh, end of the pay spectrum might be an issue because when they're on furlough you are entitled or you are able unless they're undertaking training you're able or you're permitted to allow that rate to fall below what would have been the national minimum wage if they're coming back and working for you then of course that isn't the case anymore but simply put if you reach agreement with them then yes you can you can do so now next frequently asked question can i make the payment to the employee subject to the successful reimbursement of that sum of money from the cjrs scheme and yes you can um, you can have clauses within your uh, within your furlough agreements that actually state that the payment is conditional upon that reimbursement um, now of course because we've got quite a quick turnaround in terms of the payments that are being made by uh, by the HMRC that six to ten days that I was talking about earlier then an awful lot of the time we can we can become quite we can become aware of any particular issues in relation to the HMRC not paying us or the scheme not paying us um, quite quickly um, and in fact what we would want to know is we'd want to know it before we actually pay the money to the employee um, because uh, because otherwise trying to recover it from the employee is going to be obviously fraught with some difficulty practical difficulty rather than necessarily um, legal difficulty but you can have it that the payment is also delayed until you get that reimbursement so those are permitted within the the rules of the scheme but what you've obviously got to ensure is that everything that you recover in relation to that employee from the scheme does get paid to them okay now next frequently asked question and this is then where we get into some of the more complex issues and also is this is this is i think going to be a real problem um i'm going to say a real problem it's it's a real problem that can be managed and hopefully isn't going to practically become a real problem um for many employers but i can see that there are going to be issues in relation to this and this all turns on the fact that well now we get to the 1st of July you want some people to re who are on furlough at the moment to return to work to do some part-time work but then how do you do that if then the employee that you're trying to bring back into the workplace is then saying well I can't return to work because of the childcare and obviously th this is applying to those people who cannot work from home because if they can work from home then obviously um, there isn't too much of an issue that we have here albeit that there there's there's perhaps um you know interruptions in terms of their uh, of their days and you might have issues or there might be issues and problems for both the employee and the employer in terms of productivity but we'll deal with those productivity uh points at a uh, at a later point in the webinar i am going to come to them i am going to address them now the issue that we've got here is in relation to mainly the risk of a sex indirect sex discrimination claim because of course what we've got at the moment is that while some nurseries and schools have opened to some extent they are only taking very limited numbers um now there might have been an assumption that well we're getting to the summer holidays shortly anyway so um schools wouldn't have been open at this time in any event but of course a lot of uh, parents would have been relying upon holiday camps during this period of time you know other child care uh, facilities and a lot of those have already been cancelled and so the child care provision is is in a little bit of a state of crisis for those employees who are trying to balance the needs of child care and work so many parents are still going to have continuing child care issues um, which effectively prevents them from being able to return to their workplace if they're unable to work from home and so as an employer you need to be mindful of that now for those of you who have been watching any of the uh, uh, press conferences by the government the, the the coronavirus press conferences this specific question has been asked a couple of times direct question has been asked a couple of times um, of the government by uh, by members of the public you know what happens in these circumstances and all the government have said really is well everyone's just going to have to do the best they can uh, they haven't really come up with any solution um, and as an employer this puts us in a bit of a difficult situation bit of a difficult position because um, 
if we are going to require employees to return to work, regardless of their particular circumstances, then it's likely that this is going to be a provision criterion or practice that is going to indirectly discriminate against women who statistically have greater childcare responsibility. So we can potentially justify it because there is a further step within um, that legislation, um, within the indirect discrimination legislation, which allows an employer to objectively justify um, the that requirement, that PCP, the requirement to come back to work on the basis that it's a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. But of course, that's going to be varied uh, from case to case and circumstance to circumstances, both from the employer and the employee. Um, the simplest solution is, of course, enabling people to work from home. Now, if they can't do their normal job working from home, it might be that there's some alternative work that you could get them to do which they can do from home. So always consider that as an option. So don't necessarily get too focused uh, in on the actual job they do, their, their normal job. Uh, now, what are your other options? So if somebody is saying that they can't come back to work because of childcare issues, what are your options? Well, you are allowed to continue to use furlough. Now, I completely appreciate that come the 1st of August, that comes with a cost because the employer is having to make a contribution to furlough. Um, but of course, if that's then going to avoid an indirect sex discrimination claim, then that might be a small cost in the circumstances, given that, as we said, when we were having a look back at the, back at the figures, that um, from the 1st of August, that's limited to the employer's national insurance contributions and pension contributions. From the 1st of September, it's gonna cost a maximum of 312 pounds a month. And then from the 1st of October, it's gonna cost a maximum of 625 pounds per month. So in the big scheme of things, perhaps the figures aren't, uh, uh, certainly the figures are more favorable for the employee in terms of it undermining a, an argument by the employer that actually that isn't reasonable in the circumstances. But there are other options because you are not obliged to furlough people. So it's not that you must furlough people, albeit that um, it is probably the easiest solution that you've got. You could also have a look at parental leave because of course parental leave provides each parent with 18 weeks unpaid leave. Now, of course, the point here is that it's unpaid leave. So if you're refusing to furlough somebody, and it might be that you were refusing to furlough somebody because within the constraints of the furlough scheme, you cannot, um, furlough them because you've already hit the hit the maximum number or perhaps they weren't furloughed before the 10th of June albeit that you know if they couldn't work from home that's very unlikely indeed but you have got parental leave so that's under section 76 of the Employment Rights Act 18 weeks of unpaid leave per parent per child so that provides where there is a uh, say a two-parent family that provides for 36 weeks coverage potential 36 weeks coverage although I appreciate that not everyone is going to have two parents around necessarily that can take that leave or um, we also have dependents leave under section 57a of the Employment Rights Act albeit that this isn't quite so useful because this is all to do with unforeseen circumstances so it's not it's not supposed to be used as a long-term solution but, but those are really your options. So it's furlough, parental leave, and perhaps for a short period of time, dependence leave. Now, the other risks that you've got here, I've talked main, I've talked only really about um, uh, indirect sex discrimination, but you've also got potential whistleblowing issues here as well, because if the uh, employee believes that they are being forced back to work and that then that is going to put the health and safety of their child at risk, um, which is then going to be a breach of a legal obligation, then that is someone who is blowing the whistle. And then if they're then subjected to a detriment or dismissed because they have blown the whistle, then obviously that's then going to be an automatically unfair dismissal. It's not going to have a cap in compensation and they don't need the two year service requirement. So there's some other issues that we need to bear in mind in relation to that. So, Another frequently asked question that we get. So should I allow a shielding employee to return to work? And I've, 
I've had a couple of calls in relation to this where we've had issues of uh, an employee who's supposed to be shielding, but quite frankly, is on their own at home. Probably, you know, having the impact, you know, because we've re all read about the the impact on people's mental health that uh, uh, being isolated at home is is causing people. And so, in some circumstances, we've been experiencing issues where employees have been wanting to return to work in fact presenting themselves at work saying look just look, please let me back um now from the 1st of august in england and england only we don't have the published rules in relation to wales or scotland yet they've made no particular announcement in this regard but from the 1st of august in england the guidance is going to be relaxed so that a clinically extremely vulnerable employee is going to be no longer advised to shield and so they're going to be able to return to their workplace as long, of course, as their workplace is COVID secure. OK, so that's adhering to all of the guidance. And again, little section a little bit later on in relation to, to, to how you do that, how to ensure that there's a safe return to work for people. Um, so. Now, broadly speaking, essentially what we're looking at here is it's a bit similar to when somebody's on sick leave and they're then saying but i want to return to work whilst they are still signed off sick so what we're going to have to do is we're going to you know because obviously you have got to ensure that you're meeting your duty of care that you're safeguarding the um you're taking reasonable steps to ensure that you're providing a safe workplace and a safe system of work um, for that shielding employee whether they have, a, and of course, they might have a protected characteristic such as disability or pregnancy, which of course then means that you have additional duties, and of course it presents then additional risks as in in turn. Um, so you're not obliged until we get to the first of August. You're not obliged to actually um, permit that employee to return to work. So what we would be saying to you is go and get some expert medical evidence before you allow them to return to work. Now, I know probably the next question you're going to ask is that, well, if they're presenting themselves for work, they are saying that they are fit for work. Um, what do we have to do in terms of payment? Are we suspending them because of, um, essentially is it a health and safety suspension at which point does full pay kick in? Now, none of the, none of the guidance is, um, has really nailed this point. Um, because ordinarily there's a risk that if an employee remains at home, if you ask, excuse me, if you ask an employee, normally speaking, if there is a risk that, um, you ask an employee to remain at home, uh, when they have offered or provided themselves as fit to return to work, then to do so could amount to a breach of trust and confidence. Now, our view is that you know really the, the, the in in these particular circumstances in these uh, and I know the un, uh, overused word but in these unprecedented circumstances that we're in at the moment that we don't think that's actually likely to happen um, it's unlikely that an employee would go down that route and it's also unlikely in our view that an employment tribunal would uphold that as uh, a fundamental breach of trust and confidence but one of the things that you should be looking at is you should be looking at minimizing um, the financial implications for the employee. So again, look at the possibility of taking up alternative roles, perhaps alternative working patterns that where you can limit uh, their exposure as a, a as a potentially criti critically vulnerable employee, or just simply put them on furlough. Okay, we've still got that ba ultimate backstop of uh, furloughing the employee. Okay, so, and excuse my my sneeze just then. Um, can I make an employee redundant during furlough? Well, yes, you can. Now, there are a lot of issues that have come up in relation to redundancy. Um, there is a, there is a good argument for you being able to make people redundant despite the existence of the furlough scheme um, on the 31st of July. Because until the 31st of July, uh, we have access to a scheme 
that enables the continued employment of employees with only a very limited cost to you as the employer. And when I say a very limited cost, essentially the only cost is the continued accrual of holiday pay, or should I say holiday accrual that will then be paid in lieu, unless of course you require them to take the holiday during that period of time. And we're gonna get onto holiday uh, and furlough in a second uh, and the issues surrounding that. But you could make it a condition of any agreement that they then take their holiday during that period of time, which then negates that accrual of holiday. And so therefore means that you continue to keep them employed until the 31st of all, the 31st of July, sorry, at no cost to you. So that's all well and good. I also think that there is justification for you then not extending employment beyond that period of time, beyond the 31st of July, because of course, from the 1st of August, there then begins to become costs in relation to the scheme. And as an employer, if you can show that actually we, we are in a situation where we're needing to save costs, why would we continue to accrue cost um, at this time? Because essentially it might be that if you continue to accrue cost for all the employees that you would otherwise be making redundant until the 31st of October, that might be another head. That might be another person that you have to make redundant as a result. So you've got a sound justification for not continuing beyond the 31st of July in our view. Um, some people take the view that actually you can make redundancies now, that you don't have to continue to furlough them until the 31st of July. And of course, if somebody um, hasn't been furloughed before the 10th of June, or you know, for whatever other reason in relation to the rules of the scheme that you cannot furlough them, then of course you can make them redundant now. Or alternatively, if the employee doesn't agree to be furloughed, then of course you can make them redundant now. Um, but if you can furlough them and they agree to be furloughed, then I do believe that you, we, we do get into a bit of a problem in terms of the fairness of the redundancy um, if we do dismiss before the 31st of July. Um, now, of course, what would happen if we did make them, you know, say, for example, if we made somebody redundant today on the 8th of July, rather than extending the employment out to the 31st of July, what's the impact of that? Well, it's likely to be very limited, but we do need to be aware of the fact that, you know, if there were other, um, other opportunities that arose within the business, other vacancies which arose within the business in the intervening period of time, or alternatively, the company then got a huge order in um, a week later that would have then negated the need to make that employee redundant um, uh, had they continued employment until 31st July. So it's that sort of that sort of point. So it's not necessarily going to uh, be, uh, whilst it might be unfair, the consequences of it being unfair are in most instances going to still be quite limited because we'd simply be saying, well, you would have gone on the 31st of July in any event. Okay, so you can make employees redundant during furlough, of course, assuming that uh, you have got a fair reason uh, for redundancy and there is a redundancy situation in, in any event. Now, moving on to collective consultation, because of course, if you're making 20 or more people redundant, then there is this additional obligation on you to collectively consult um, with elected employee representatives. Um, now, I've certainly seen uh, some correspondence from trade unions um, who are refusing to get involved. Uh, they're refusing to, um, to sit down with the employer to partake in any collective consultations uh, during the furlough period. Now, the main reason for that is that they are saying that uh, section 188 open brackets five of the Trade Union Labour Relations Consolidation Act of 1992. Section 188 is the one that sets out all of the obligations in relation to collective consultation. This section says that employee representatives must have access to the employees in order to participate in the consultation process. So clearly they've got to be able to communicate with all of the employees, with all of those that they represent in order to provide effective consultation. And if um, a number of employees don't have um, the means of communicating via video link or they don't have internet connection or they don't have mobile phones, then how does that happen? Because of course, the opportunity to have collective meetings within the workplace has 
is 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 almost certainly not possible and so some some employment uh, some trade unions are taking the view that actually collective consultation cannot take place effectively now in a how can i put this if 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 you're in a modern workplace environment where you do have all of those facilities or in fact as an employee you take the um you go that extra mile to ensure that every employee has appropriate systems in place so that they can um take part in these uh, uh consultation processes that it might be that you can get over that hurdle but you do just need to bear in mind that you not only need to ensure that those that you are consulting with and when i say those that you're consulting with the employer representative it's not just about providing that communication between the employer and the employee representatives on a zoom call or whatever but it's also making sure that those employee representatives have access to all of the employees that they are representing as well and if you if they're unable to do that then there is the possibility that that um consultation isn't going to be meaningful and of course if it's not meaningful what happens we get into the issues of protective awards which is up to 90 days pay for every affected employee so it's quite a crucial point for you to bear in mind um but perhaps now that the uh the restrictions in relation to um covid are being relaxed um then it might be possible for you to have or for your employer representatives to have a number of meetings on site um, of course ensuring that they're all appropriately socially distanced and so on and so forth meeting all of the other guidelines as necessary okay so that is the collective consultation i did promise you we'd get on to annual leave and here we are so is the issue of annual leave any clearer well yes and no so Let's go through the, the 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 principles here so employees can take holiday during furlough that's all fine um, the employees can book their holiday and they can take holiday and unless of course you've as an employer have cancelled their holiday if they have booked holiday and they want to take the holiday um, then they're perfectly entitled to do so in the normal way obviously when they are on holiday they are then getting paid their normal pay now you can still be claiming from the cgrs scheme but what it does mean is that then you have to do an additional calculation to make sure you're topping up that pay to their normal pay now we then get into the issue of whether the employee uh can ask the employee or should i say to require the employee to take holiday whilst they are on furlough now this is subject to two provisions first of all in the contract of employment so what provision is there in the contract of employment for you to uh, require employees to take holiday because if you have that in the contract of employment then you can exercise that right it doesn't necessarily matter that they are on furlough and so therefore you can um, you can require them to take the holiday if you don't have the contractual right reserved then there is a provision within the working time regulations regulation 15.4 which um, provides that sorry regulation 15 not necessarily regulation 15.4 because that's the, the uh, a different provision so regulation 15 provides that you can give notice to employees for them to take holiday the period of notice that you've got to give is twice as long as the period of holiday that they're going to that you're going to require them to take so if you're going to require them to take one week you need to give them two weeks notice two weeks four weeks notice one day two days etc etc so all fairly straightforward but we do have a little bit of a curveball in the guidance here so now that curveball is the bottom point so where it says this potential issue so if an employer requires a worker to take holiday while on furlough the employer should consider whether any restrictions the worker is under such as the need to socially distance or self-isolate would prevent the worker from resting relaxing enjoying leisure time which is the fundamental purpose of holiday so this throws up a few issues so some very well respected legal commentators believe that there is a real risk for the employer enforcing employees to take holiday during furlough 
in that they believe that you can't because the employee is not going to be able to rest and relax and enjoy leisure time being the fundamental purpose of holiday in the current climate where there are restrictions as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, my view is that there is an argument there in relation to that because that's what the working time regulations require. But there are a couple of points here. First of all, if the amount of holiday that you're requiring an employee to take doesn't impinge on the 5.6 weeks under the working time regs, so say for example you've got a full-time worker who gets uh, 33 days holiday including the bank holidays well that means you can still because 28 days is 5.6 weeks you can still require that employee to take five days annual leave during furlough without impinging on any of their statutory rights so that's the first point however if you're going to require them to have more than that or you just simply don't have the wriggle room between the contractual provision and, and the statutory minimum then yes the issue of whether they're going to be able to rest and relax and enjoy leisure time might be an argument but first of all restrictions are being lifted so the heavy restrictions that were in place um, before a couple of weeks ago well certainly before the 4th of July I mean after all we can in England anyway we can now go to the pub from the 4th of July so there is the opportunity now to rest and relax and enjoy leisure time being the fundamental purpose of holiday so that is now possible if you have required employees to take holiday before the relaxation of the rules then there still does there's still a risk in relation to this underlying principle but this is going to vary on a case-by-case -case basis so it's not simply that every employee who is required to take holiday before the relaxation of the lockdown rules is going to be able to claim that holiday back that simply isn't the case I'm sure that there are many of you who are sat there listening and, and watching this who are who are probably thinking well I've taken plenty of time off as holiday to look after the kids and do DIY etc etc and that certainly wasn't restful or relaxing or relaxing and I certainly didn't have any leisure time um, but putting those personal issues and views uh, to one side I think that really what we're looking at here are those people who as a result of the lockdown or as a result of their particular circumstances um, are not able to rest and relax because they are shielding um, and, and I think with those employees that you're in particular you're going to have to take a uh, a more prudent approach to whether you are going to uh, force them to continue to take their holiday so essentially all I'm saying is that this issue is it's not an absolute banker so you you it isn't um, it isn't that you can simply require people to take holiday and there isn't going to be any comeback on it there could be some comeback on it my view is that I think the risk is relatively low it's going to be limit in limited circumstances in limited time frame so I'm not suggesting for a moment that for any employer who has been requiring their employees to take holiday should alter their alter their approach but if they do have employees with particular circumstances you might want to uh, adjust uh, adjust the um, or you know adjust your approach to those particular individuals but you'll judge that on a case-by-case -case basis of course so don't worry we're coming to the coming towards the end of our uh, flexible furlough uh, point and well as I pointed out at the beginning I told you I had quite a bit of content and uh, and I can see that I would have been struggling to fit all of this into my planned one and a half hour session so um, hopefully you're all you're all still there and uh, and bearing with me whilst I I go through this um, now the new CJRS direction now just to briefly explain what we've got here governing the rules of the furlough scheme is we've had a number of uh, bits of guidance that have been published by the government and we've all also had these treasury directions now these treasury directions are a more formal way of trying to formulate the guidance into a more legal document they're not actually regulations as such um, but they are um, they're more significant than the guidance um, and so 
we need to be very very careful when uh, in relation to anything that's said in the in the Treasury direction now last week um, or should I say no sorry the week before last what we had was the Treasury issued their third direction um, so whereas we've had numerous versions of the guidance so as you can as you can see published the 26th of June so just a few days before uh, the flexible furlough scheme came into operation on the 1st of July so this is the third one now the main point to take from this is that there was then a rather concerning worrying paragraph that was introduced into this third edition of the uh, Treasury direction that we hadn't seen before in either of the previous two directions and we hadn't seen in any of the guidance either so what it says as you can see there is that it is integral to the purpose of the CGRS scheme let me just make this big so that you can see it properly integral to the purpose of the CJRS scheme is that the amounts paid to an employer are used by the employer to continue the employment of employees in respect of who the CJRS claim is made and so essentially what that is saying or at least one interpretation of what that is saying is that you cannot access the scheme you cannot make claims under the scheme if you are not seeking to continue the employment of employees um, so it seems to suggest that if you are making people redundant that you cannot make a claim under the scheme um, now this has come about we suspect because there has been significant criticism of employers using the scheme to essentially fund redundancy or should I say to fund notice payments it's not obviously funding redundancy payments statutory redundancy payments or any contractual enhanced redundancy payments but certainly it does in relation to notice or has been used by employers in relation to notice um, in particular the aviation minister Kelly Tolhurst um, criticized British Airways's decision to dismiss employees on furlough and then on the 29th of June so this is after the publication of this Treasury direction the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions expressed similar concern about the use of CGRS funds as a mean of paying wages without an intention to keep the relevant employees employed so what does that mean for us and you know in in terms of any employer that is going through a redundancy process can you continue to make claims under the CJRS scheme or not um, now there are some commentators who have taken a a rather I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating to say a rather negative view a rather pessimistic view I think actually you know it is quite right for many of us to be concerned by this um, because what it does effectively it, it gives a risk it gives employers a risk in terms of notice pay so say for example where you have given notice of redundancy to an employee they've said hey keep me on furlough we've been concerned about the fact that well yes we've probably got to keep you on furlough until the 31st of July anyway because if we make you redundant when you are willing to be furloughed until the 31st of July then that's an alternative to dismissal albeit only a temporary alternative to dismissal but it's an alternative to dismissal um, and so therefore that could be an unfair dismissal we could be exposing ourselves as an employer in that situation so it's not necessarily simply about wanting to subsidize the notice pay albeit that that is one of the effects of it it's about also the employer wanting to avoid an unfair dismissal claim um, but there has been great concern raised about this um, there has also been concern raised about not necessarily just about notice pay and where notice has already been issued it's about whether if you're entering into a redundancy process if you're entering into a redundancy consultation does that then put a put a bar on you being able to make claims under the scheme well we think not and and there, there are two schools for thought for thought on this I mean there are um, a number of uh, legal resources which I've seen that are taking a very uh, 
not pessimistic, but a very cautious approach to this and saying, uh, we think there's a real risk here and so therefore you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't be uh, claiming from the CGRS whilst you've got somebody on notice, for example. Um, there are a number of no, uh, number of other commentators, and for those of you who are aware of uh, Daniel Barnett, I'm quite happy to, to to name check him here because he takes the opposite view, and I've got to say I do agree with him in that what the wording of the uh, of the uh, paragraph, if we just go back to it, it says <coughs> um, that you cannot claim um, unless you are using those funds to continue the employment of the employee well clearly you are you are continuing the employment of the employee you're not using it to subsidize a payment in lieu of notice you're using it to uh, continue to employ the employee in circumstances where perhaps you wouldn't be otherwise so you are continuing the employment of the employee now also a number of uh, uh, significant law firms have been uh, heavily tweeting the hmrc uh, direct messaging the HMRC to try to get clarification from them. Um, Lewis Sil Silkin being the most prominent uh, and they tweeted a couple of days ago to say that they had been given verbal reassurance so it hasn't been put in writing but they've been given verbal reassurance by the HMRC that you can continue to claim uh, furlough payments under the CGRS scheme even though somebody might be under notice of termination for redundancy. So as far as we're aware it's all okay but I wanted to flag it up to you I wanted to discuss it with you um, because of course there are there are different schools of thoughts here and you may read something that is far more pessimistic um, than the view that I've uh, expressed here albeit like I said with the with the grateful assistance of uh, Daniel Barnett and uh, Lewis Silkin in being able to to come to those views um, so that really that concludes our session on the flexible furlough scheme so certainly for this section of the webinar I'm now going to just uh, bring it to an end um, there is going to be part two um, and uh, obviously that's going to continue with the agenda that uh, that I uh, introduced a little bit earlier so I hope that's been interesting as I said any questions um, please do email me or DM me on LinkedIn uh, or Twitter or give me a call. Um, all of my contact details are going to be set out on uh, in the following uh, sessions because of course I, I, I do that at the end and of course I would have done this all in one session but I haven't done so but they'll, they will be there. For those of you who are existing clients of course you'll have my details so please just uh, feel free to, uh, to drop me a line. So hopefully you found that useful. Um, please do uh, watch the other videos as well and my apologies that this wasn't a live session for you all but hopefully um, this is still providing you with useful useful information and useful content so hopefully see you very shortly thanks very much mm -hmm.